our next speaker, or LinkedIn has ranked him as one of the top 10 business influencers in the LinkedIn network. And that puts him just behind Bill Gates and Sir Richard Branson. So very influential person in the business community. Um, we asked him what his biggest prediction for the next year is in data. And I think it's with some authority that he answers and some authority that we should listen. Um, his answer is AI will automate more things faster than we think, from, from passenger drones to doctors. So with that, to speak on big data success and practice and the biggest mistakes to avoid, please welcome Bernard Marr. Bernard, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. When I speak at this level, can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. I was giving a presentation in China maybe 10 years ago, and the audience was much larger, so I asked the same question, and no one responded. So I spoke up a little and said, can everyone hear me okay? And again, no reply. And again, I spoke a little louder until the lady who organized the talk said, Mr. Ma, they can all hear you. They just can't understand you. <laughs> Which is not a fantastic start to a presentation. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. What I want to do is share with you what I see as some of the top use cases in big data um, from a business perspective. And then I want to highlight some of what I see best practices, some of the key challenges, and maybe some of the mistakes we need to avoid to make data really the driver of a new industrial revolution. What we're experiencing at the moment is something that the world has never seen before. We now have more data than ever before. The vast majority of all the data we have in the world was generated in the last two or three years. We are expected to see an increase in data from around five to six zettabytes today to about 20 to 25 zettabytes over the next five years. So a massive explosion. And this data is the fuel for this new industrial revolution. I'm a regular contributor to the World Economic Forum, and their CEO, Klaus Schwab, talks about a fourth industrial revolution that we are experiencing at the moment. And I believe data is the base for all of this. If you com combine data with the Internet of Things, with artificial intelligence, with cloud computing, we have something that has never been there before. And what I want to do is highlight some of the use cases, some of the fascinating examples I've seen and companies I've worked with, and then hopefully highlight some of the things we can do better. For me, there are five use cases, and they are all overlapping a little bit, like these jigsaw pieces. The first use case for me is about informing decision making. So this is about using data, both strategically and operationally, to actually help us make better decisions, understand our world, make better decisions. The second use case is about better understanding our customers and understanding trends and market and getting a 360 degree view of our customers and what they are doing, what they might be buying in the future. The, second, the third use case for me is again linked to customers, but this time it's about actually improving our customer value proposition. It's all about delivering smarter products and smarter services where we integrate some of the data capabilities and analytics capabilities into what we are offering to our customers. The fourth use case is about automating some of your key business processes. It's about driving efficiencies across your operations. And the last use case is monetization, where we start using data as an asset that we can sell and also as an asset that actually drives the value of our businesses. And what I want to do now is to look at each of these different use cases, starting with decision making, and give you some examples and highlight some of the best practices. One of my favorite examples comes from Google. 
Google has this ambition that every bit of management decision, every bit of decision making that takes place has to be informed by data. And I loved Scott's mes message earlier that your business strategy has to be your data strategy and has to be your cloud strategy. Because this is exactly what Google does. And actually on a board level for the holding company Alphabet, they have now identified their biggest business challenges and their biggest business questions. They regularly revise those questions. And their executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, now says that they are running Google based on those questions. So every bit of management reporting that now goes to the board has to help them answer some of these around 35 questions. And as I said, these evolve over time. But what Google wants to do is to make sure that this decision making takes place all across the organization, not just on the very top, but across the entire business. And this is where sometimes more traditional businesses are struggling. How do we give people access to data? One of my clients is Walmart, the largest retailer in the world. And what Walmart wanted to do is to say, we have uh, 100, 150 petabyte data cloud, and we want to make this available to our people. So people working in their retail stores, in their headquarters, we said, we want to give this to them so they can make better informed decisions. I find this still a big challenge for lots of organizations when they want to enter the self-service world. Because what we often underestimate is the amount it takes to train people, to transfer some of the skills. I've seen lots of self-service projects where they said, here you have a nice little interface, and here you have our 150 petabyte of data. Good luck, you find the answers. And then the challenge is that lots of people don't quite know what data is available, how to analyze this data. So what Walmart did was fascinating. They created these data cafes. They were actually physical coffee shops or little coffee areas where you could come in so any business person could turn up, grab a cup of coffee, and then sit down with a data analyst and say, OK, this is my business challenge. This is my question. How can, we, how can the data help me answer some of those questions? And this is really powerful, because this way you would transfer some of the skills. You get some hand-holding. The other thing that I, I, so this whole governance around giving people access to data, we need to rethink a little. We need more hand-holding. And we also need to have different structures. So in, in Germany, the Daimler company, uh, Dieter Zetscher, their CEO, says actually we wanted to, that he's now trying to restructure the organization to make it flatter, to give more people access to data so they can make decisions so we don't have all the traditional hierarchy layers that makes it really difficult for people to actually make data-informed decisions. The other thing that as part of this, we need to rethink is some of the job roles. At the moment, I see lots of bottlenecks where data scientists and analysts are the key bottlenecks. And actually, what I've seen success successful companies do really well is that they have created roles like data translators. So these would the, be the people that sit in the data cafes that help to bridge the technical and business world and help both of them understand each other a bit better. The next use case, then, is to help us understand our customers a little bit better. And I sometimes get asked, OK, big data is all well and good, but this is just for big companies. So I thought, OK, I'll give you an example from a local butcher's shop. So this is a London butcher's shop. I worked with them, and they wanted, they had a few challenges around customers. They said, I actually want to understand what are the kind of marketing messages that will attract customers. I want to understand my conversion ratio, so how many people walk past my shop and end up stopping, looking at the shopping window, and walking inside the shop. So what we thought we'd do is, OK, we said, let's instead of simply relying on your existing data, we find new data sources. And this is, for me, another key message here, is that we need more data diversity. For me, 
companies that do well are usually more diverse businesses. And what I find is that more successful companies are also those that have more diverse data sets, where we start looking at external data sources. All the data that is already being generated around us, where we bring in some of the more unstructured data sources like imaging, videos, photographs, voice data, and so on. So in this case, we installed a little device that will pick up our mobile phone signals in the window, in the shopping window of this butchers. Our mobile phones are continuously sending out signals to find Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connections. So no personal data is being transmitted. And these, because we all carry smartphones, it simply counts how many phones walk past, how many of them stop, and how many of them walk into the shop. So for something like 100 euros, they were able to now have an accurate understanding of customer footfall and conversion ratios, which then allowed them to experiment with new um, marketing messages. So they would change the boards outside. One day it would say, we're competing on price, so come in and we beat the supermarket. Another time, it would be a more inspirational message saying what we are doing is today you come in, you get the recipe that has been passed down through generations. You can come in, get the recipe card and all the ingredients. And this was the message that really worked. What was interesting is that when we analyzed the footfall data, they realized that late at night, around 11 o'clock, there was a big footfall. And they never realized this. So what they did is they applied, say, because there were some pups on the same stretch of, the, of, 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 of this butchers, and they said, if we could open for an hour at night, we could sell them something. And instead of just saying we sell them sausages, they went to Google Trends to see what are some of the key food trends that we're seeing at the moment. And the key trends at this point were shiritsu and pulled pork. So they were now selling, or they started selling in a little pop-up store, shiritsu and pulled pork burgers. And today, 50% of their profits is coming from this one hour at night. The other thing they started to do is to pull in weather data. Most governments now have open data policies where they're making data available. So the Met Office in the UK makes data available. So this butcher pulls in some of this data to help them predict how many sausages they need to make for the next weekend, depending on the likelihood of, of sunshine and barbecues. The other extreme, a very large organization, Disney, very often very innovative. They want to understand their customers. And two examples here that I find fascinating. One is that they are starting to give visitors to their theme parks, these magic bands. So they are wristbands that have RFID sensors in them and GPS trackers. So this now allows Disney to get a complete understanding of how their visitors use their theme parks. parks. It alerts them when the queues are bu building up at certain rides, and they can manage all of this in real time. Another fascinating area is where Disney started to experiment with, again, image um, analytics. So they're now using cameras in some of their theaters to, it's like here having cameras looking at all of you, looking at all of your faces at the same time, and watching your facial expressions. Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you surprised? And they're, again, now using this data to get real-time feedback on what audience make of those shows that they are performing. The next use case is about creating a new customer value proposition. So this is about creating smarter products and smarter services for your customers. And the first example here comes from the Royal Bank of Scotland. What I have seen in the financial services industry and lots of other industries, you, I guess you could put Facebook into this, this category, is that they have tried to hide what data they're collecting and they've hidden it a little bit from their customers of how they're now able to use this data. And I'm sure you've seen this in the financial services world where companies would basically raise an insurance premium 
exactly the amount that they know will not make you go into a comparison site to find a new, a new policy. And they will not tell you when your interest rate drops from a really nice interest rate that they lured you in with to one that then suddenly a year later goes to almost nothing. So what Royal Bank of Scotland said is we want to, cr we, we want to change this. We want to use the data to really help our customers and benefit them. And their data strategy was all around delivering value back to their customers. So they have, they're now able to alert customers saying, your interest rate is dropping. And they're now being able to, some of the premium customers would get free travel insurance. They would then scan their accounts and say, okay, you're also paying for an external tra travel insurance. You're basically paying double. You might want to get rid of one of these policies. And what this does is that this develops trust. And for me, this is a key message for me for today that what we need to do as businesses is to create transparency and create trust, especially in the context of GDPR, which I believe is a positive thing because it will help us rethink the way we collect and use data to really deliver benefits to customers. Another example is an industrial example, Coney. Coney they are one of the world's leading lift and escalator manufacturers. And again, what they wanted to do is to have a new customer value proposition. And what they were saying to their customers is that you buy our escalators and our lifts, and they will never break down. Because what we will do is we will remotely monitor all of them. We will use Internet of Things technology and sensors that we build into all our escalators, into all our lifts. These will send information back into our data cloud and we will use this to predict problems. So one of the key data points were the vibrations on the cables that pull a lift up and down. And when, when these vibrations get stronger, this is a predictor that the motor needs replacing or servicing at some point. So what they're now doing is they're controlling this remotely. They will identify that this lift needs servicing at some point and then they will schedule the servicing based on the optimum time when the lift usually is not used very much. And this is, again, a more intelligent product and services where they're really changing their customer value proposition and actually putting themselves into a much better position compared to their competitors. The other thing that I'm seeing in, in their organization is that more and more of this analysis is now moving to the edge. So we're seeing edge computing that actually the power of and the, the capabilities of analyzing data now sits within those lifts. So we need to transfer less data back to a central cloud. They have this little nice tool where you can actually listen to the conversation between the lift and the data cloud, and they translate this now into human language, so you can now listen saying, okay, I'm this, this lift, I'm on level two, I'm now accelerating, I'm going to level three, three people just came into my lift, I'm now going down, and they're basically collecting huge amounts of data that will en enable them to become a better company and offer a better product. The other thing they're doing is they're creating these digital twins. So digital twin technology is another thing that I'm seeing, where we basically create digital copies of these lifts and then are able to simulate certain changes before we actually send a maintenance engineer out and make those changes in the real world. The next case is automating and improving your operations and business processes. This is all about using data to do things better, more efficiently, and cheaper. A great example, I now live in, in London, and our local tennis championship, Wimbledon, uses this very effectively. They use an IBM system called Slam Tracker which basically measures and analyzes and tracks data on everything that takes place on the tennis court. So they will measure the trajectory of the ball using sensors and cameras. In the past, they also had two people watching each of the games who would then code some of the moves, say this was a serve, this was a return, 
Nowadays, they're using machine learning algorithms to do this coding. The Tennis Federation has also just started to allow smart tennis records. So uh, a tennis record from a company like Babola is now able to measure exactly where the ball has hit, been hit, the spin that has been generated. So this is even increasing the amount of data. All of this is put into a nice little cloud. This is now being analyzed. And what companies, what sports companies are now able to do is that they can analyze this data in real time and even translate this into match reports, into a match report that until now was only ever been written by a sports journalist who would then sit, watch the game, and then produce a match report. Some of the sports reports that are now automatic, automatically generated using machine learning tools, I cannot distinguish from some of the reports written by some of the best journalists. I also have a regular column in Forbes, and Forbes also uses tools like automated insights and narrative science to take analyst data from companies and turn them into analyst reports. So in, an increasing number of even Forbes articles are now written by robots. And I believe this has huge implications. The other thing is it allows you to have conversations with data using chatbot tools, for example. Um, another example, an insurance client of mine, what they want to do is to create a completely dynamic insurance premium where they're saying what we want to do is, instead of you paying us based on what car you're driving and how, often, how many miles you drive and where you live and your gender, gender we, you pay us based on how well you're driving. So in the, initially, they installed devices in the car that tracks your driving. Now they're using an app because the technology in our phones is so sophisticated. The app will track not only how fast you're driving and if you're driving within the speed limits, but it will also pull in other data because most roads in lots of developed countries are now classified based on past accident um, numbers. So they will assess, are you using dangerous roads? What are the weather conditions? What are the traffic conditions? And based on all of this, if you are driving during rush hour along quite dangerous roads, a little bit faster than you should, too close to others, then in the rain, then you might pay a lot, of, a lot for your car insurance. People who drive at 11 o'clock in the morning when there's no traffic along really safe roads might pay no car insurance. The other thing they've started to do is to, in their claims handling, they try to automate this, one of their biggest processes, so that if you use the app, the app will know if you had a crash at a certain speed. So if your speed exceeds a certain limit, you will automatically get paid because the app tells you the speed was at this limit and therefore the car is a write-off. They've also used now voice analytics in their contact centers. So when someone rings in, the data will detect whether someone might not be telling the truth because our pitch of voice changes when we're lying. So they're now using this to flag this up to call center agents say, okay, this looks a bit suspicious here. You might want to investigate this claim a little bit further. The next one is where we have AI-enabled processes and use AI to actually monetize some of this. So it's not about process optimization. This one is about making money from your data. And and generating an income and increasing the value of your business. And again, we've already heard about intelligent farming. This is one of my favorite examples. John Deere, a very traditional Midwest American tractor and farm equipment manufacturer. And they have been using data now for a long time. They have really entered this digital transformation where they've transformed themselves from a traditional manufacturing business to a digital business that now delivers self-driving tractors. They d have now drones that will monitor the crop conditions. And what they are now doing, the, the first product they created was an, an intelligent farming system where they would install little sensors into your field. 
and these sensors would pick up the soil conditions and based on the soil conditions and some weather forecasts and some external data they will pull in, this intelligent farming system will give farmers some advice on what would be the best crops to grow on those fields, in these fields. And then once you, you've decided what to grow, they will then give you the optimum route the tractor can take across the field to minimize fuel consumption and optimize, again, the, the soil conditions. It will then advise you on what fertilizers to put down. And again, it will, able, will, able to, will, will tell you, has this fertilizer actually made the difference, or do you need to re-fertilize? And based on all of this information, as well as weather conditions and weather predictions, they are able to predict the kind of crop levels this farmer can expect. And what I find interesting is that this is now a major source of income. This company now, now makes a billion dollars selling data back to farmers. And this is a huge opportunity. I currently work with telecom companies like T-Mobile, where they have created entire teams that are now looking at how can we better monetize some of the data sets we have. Um, another great example comes from a little startup they are called ShotSpotter, and what they do is they have designed a system that uses basically microphones that you install across lampposts in cities, and these microphones will monitor the soundscape of a city. And they've developed algorithms that can now isolate gunfire. Because if you think about this, a gunshot is a quite unusual sound, and you can use algorithms to pinpoint this, this a, a gunshot. Their business model is that police forces can now subscribe to their services and identify the, the locations, because they can triangulate the data, and the time when a gun has been fired. They realize that 90% of gun crime, in particular in notorious neighborhoods in the US, is never reported to the police. So for the first time, they now have proactive, uh, this ability to proactively react to, to gunfire. This company has recently signed a deal with GE. GE produces smart street lights. Most cities around the world are currently upgrading to smart street lights and this shot spotter technology will be available. So any city across the world that is using smart street lights from GE can simply switch this on, on and use this technology. The company is now also experimenting on other use cases, like they've started using this in some of the game resorts in Africa to identify poachers, and they are now working on new sounds that you might be able to isolate, like a car crash, for example, which is another quite unusual sound that you can, you can automate. And for me, this is just the, the very beginning of all of this. Okay. I think the point has been made a few times. You are actually at the forefront of this new industrial revolution. Yesterday, we had the Data Heroes Award, um, which I was, was privileged to be one of the judges for. And we've seen amazing use cases. All of you are doing amazing stuff. And for me, it is really exciting to see the future in this field that will transform our world and it will transform our businesses. So some of the key messages for me that I want you to, to take away from today is that firstly, this is all really exciting and you are at the base of this new industrial revolution. But what we need to do is we need to really be careful about figuring out the questions we want to have an answer to. This is what we can learn from Google, where they really figure out what is our business strategy what are the key challenges and the biggest business questions we want to have an answer to, and then find the data. When it comes to the data, the big message for me is data diversity, that we need to find more data sources. We need to use all this exciting data that we're now generating from our video cameras and our photographs and our IoT sensors, all of this can be brought into our analysis to improve that. Another key 
driver for me is governance. So when we have all of this data available, we have it now in our beautiful data lake and cloud, we need to create some governance around it. And we need to make sure that we do some hand-holding, that we transfer some of the analytical skills into our businesses. Some of the bottlenecks will be relieved by having more intelligent machine learning algorithms that can actually do some of the analysis for us and some of the interpretations, and we're seeing this happening. But we need to educate people of how they can use data to inform their decision making. Another key point is that we need to develop trust. This, for me, is such an important part. And we need to, in order to create trust, what businesses need to do is they need to be upfront. They need to be very transparent. So GDPR forces us to do this. And I think this is a good thing. I said this before. We need to be very clear, instead of hiding what we're doing in 30 pages of terms and conditions that everyone agrees to because nobody ever reads them, we need to do this better. And final, my final point is that we need to create a data strategy that is based on your business strategy. This actually made me write my most recent book, which is called Data Strategy. And I'm very thankful to Hortonworks because Hortonworks will give every one of you a free copy of my new book when you fill out the conference survey. So at some point, you will get a survey come through. If you fill this out, you will get a copy of that book. So hopefully this was useful, has given you some interesting insights. Um, please feel free, to feel free to stay in touch. I find LinkedIn a fascinating way of staying in touch with people. Everything I write for the World Economic Forum and for Forbes, I now put onto LinkedIn so you will never miss anything. And if you want to learn about any of the use cases I talked about or anything else I talked about today, all of this is written up on my website where you can explore all of these case studies and lots more articles on the topic. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.